Hello, and thank you for a generous intro. So yes, my name is Olga, and um, it's good to be on stage, actually, for a change. Uh, too bad I'm the only one who is here. That's the joy of physical isolation of COVID-19. But I have um, some great people from three esteemed VCs now being connected to me socially and digitally, I hope. So without ever Without any further ado, I would like to run a short round of introductions. So I hope we are all set and uh, the guys are with me. Uh, yes, hello, can see you guys. So please, um, a quick intro, who you are, where actually you are connecting from, the VC you work for, and what is your investment focus, as well as, most importantly, I would like you to name one, maximum two, let's keep it brief, examples of the startups which you have in your portfolio. Something you might feel personally interested in, excited about, maybe future unicorn, not to single out anyone, but just to give the audience an idea what VC flavor are you. Okay, so let's do it in the um, alphabetical order, okay, of your names. So we will have Eva, Merali, and Rokas. Please, guys, the floor is yours. Okay. I will then start if you do it alphabetically. Hi, Olga. Nice to see you and nice to be with you today. So I'm Eva. I'm with Capital 300. We are a Series A fund based in Austria. So I am at the moment in Vienna. However, we invest across Europe, focusing on the German-speaking area and Central Eastern Europe, looking also at Baltics. What does it mean that we invest in the Series A stage? That means we invest in the companies that, in the teams that are out there in the market that whose products generate also the first significant revenue. And then we invest into investment rounds ranging from two to 15 million in order to boost the expansion to accelerate internationalization. We are an industry agnostic fund, which means that we invest into both B2B and B2C companies. We are looking at cybersecurity, business process automation, e-health, and so on. So really a wide range of sectors that we are excited about. In the end, what truly excites us is the teams that have the ambition to build a global player out there. Just to give you a few examples, one, two examples, as you said, so I, maybe I'll start with one that probably people might know as it is a, as it is a consumer-facing application. So we have invested in Pixar which is a mobile and also browser-based photo and video editing application with billions of downloads worldwide and definitely on the track to be a multi-billion dollar company. And another one that might be interesting as we are, we are now focusing on the Baltics and this event, so we recently invested in a company that has the roots in Riga called Localize which enables companies to streamline, streamline and make efficient the way and the process how digital content, be it apps, be it websites, be it marketing emails, gets localized, including also the translations. Happy to be here today. Thank you. Hi, Ru Hi everyone. I'm, I'm Rokas. I'm a founder and managing partner of Contrarian Ventures. Uh, we are an early stage energy tech and e-mobility focused venture capital fund investing across Europe and Israel. Primarily, our thesis is around uh, one very simple statement. Uh, the last 100 years was commodity of choice oil. The next 100 years is going to be electron. And most of our investments are looked through that lenses uh, of backing that commodity of choice for the next 100 years. And we call that sustainable energy transition. So. All our investments are uh, usually at early stage, meaning C to Series A. Uh, we usually invest up to half a million in, in our first ticket in the company. Currently have uh, 16 portfolio companies all across Europe and Israel. And uh, yeah, we're looking to, to, to see how, how world changes with this uh, very, we believe, important shift in how the energy market is changing. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, have this chat with uh, fellow investors. Yes, and hello from my side as well. I'm Marily from Karma Ventures. Um, we are a VC fund, also industry agnostic, um, invest in early stage companies. Our focus mostly is on deep tech software uh, companies, the ones that are targeting um, 
B2B or business-to-business enterprise customers. Um, we operate from Tallinn, invest across all Europe, and uh, our roots are actually uh, to Estonia and Skype founding engineers who used to do direct investments themselves, today act as our tech advisors, and from there we have this love towards technology. Um, in Latvia, for example, we have investment into Sonarworks, this is a sound calibration company. Um, uh, but uh, other than that, we have in the Baltics uh, six, seven investments. And um, typically we invest up to 3 million euros as initial round, but we can go up to 10 million. So we have like this, uh, this power to, um, let's say, help the entrepreneurs to fulfill their dreams. This is where we, we try to try to come into play. And thanks for inviting me to this panel. Okay, thank you guys, thank you. So just, you know, to have a look at the panelists yet again. We have energy tech represented by Rokas and we have software represented by Eva and Marily. And perhaps the thing which for sure is in common for all of you, you invest into startups. But then when all the differences, that's the place where all the differences are starting. And uh, with the next question, I would like to explore a little bit more those differences exactly and pin down what is really particular to energy tech versus what is particular to software. Um, let's maybe talk about such things as scouting and due diligence, uh, how it's different for energy tech VC versus software focused VC. Maybe we want to talk about the investment horizon and where you guys and when you expect the returns on your investments. Maybe we would like to talk about, you know, uh, intellectual property protection. So please guys, over to you. Maybe we will start with, uh, with Eva. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to walk through what is the general process on our side and then, you know, it's interesting to see how it is different at Contrarian Ventures and if, if you look from a different, you know, angle at the companies. So, of course, it all starts with getting to know the team and then the question where does the opportunity come from or how do we get to know the team? It, might, it, it varies a lot, so it could be an earlier investor that approaches us, it could be that we actually spot an exciting company and reach out to them, it could be a different, a different source. Then, of course, we first see, is it a personal fit, do we get along with the founders? And then, of course, like really at the high level, we look at the, look at the market, is the opportunity big enough? Is there actually demand out there? So our customers, our users actively looking for this solution. Is this something that can actually grow fast? Is this something that, you know, can, can triple the revenues in the next years and then, you know, go for this kind of uh, doubling the revenues that we, we as VCs often want to see? Of course, you look at the competition to see if, the, if there is a unique, unique advantage and if, which also then, you know, plays part of this kind of scaling equity in with regards to IP I'm curious to hear if there, if there are any differences I mean we don't expect to see patents that kind of you know help to protect the software because we all know that it's it's hot you know the patents in the software space you know they are not worth that as much you know as they are if you're building a new chip or you know building a new battery technology yeah so Rokas is this different on your side. Yeah, so probably um, the way I want to kind of um, talk about this is probably take a step back. So I think there are two types of venture capital funds. So there is uh, generalist funds and there is also specialist funds. So I think compared myself and our firm with uh, Eva and Marilia, we are a specialist fund. So uh, we're exclusively focusing, again, we do invest and we only want to invest in software companies. Uh, mostly, uh, because if we look specifically on energy tech, energy tech is not a new thing. It, it used to be called clean tech, or people now call this time of period clean tech 2.0, and it's been around for quite a long time. People forget, forget it. It's been around since 2000. So the only difference between now and then was that before it was more hardware related uh, because the software infrastructure was not available at the time, including cloud and and and, and advanced machine learning. So, so I think when, when, when I'm answering that question, I think it's the difference between us and probably uh, Muriel and Eva Fund is that we very much understand the sector that we invest from a deep-rooted perspective. So all our advisors in the fund and people that we work with, 
whether that's venture cap in venture capital, we have partners that are fully vested in partnership, and we have venture partners that help us to source deals. We definitely have more on the venture side or advisor side, the technical people from the industry to help us to navigate it. So I think the difference between us and uh, maybe a generalist fund going into the fund, they will look for more from traction perspective, and they would tend to enter later stage. Uh, where there's already a product market fit or clear guidance where that business will take off and have a high growth potential versus we tend to take these bets before the product, making more emphasis on maybe the team and background, maybe technology or go to market how they position and and leave that technology or product market fit for us to figure out together. So uh, I think that would be the only, I think due diligence wise, I think it always depends on the fund, right? Depending how much resources you have, depending what kind of people you can access. And that could would not emphasize that we do something differently from them, but maybe you have more emphasis and internal knowledge within the team. So not seeking external guidance at the first stage, but we seek uh, guidance on the very specific context where we maybe lack these expertise within the team. So I would, I would kind of, my answer would be more from that lens. Okay, thank you, Rokas. Marily, would you like to yeah, add some insights? I, I, would, I would really like be aligned with like Eva and Rokas, like especially, you know, nowadays the differentiation is not that much anymore um, about, you know, whether you are a SaaS business or software business or, or not. It's, it's rather like within, within software also you have like multiple fields, you have multiple verticals and, and this is rather like a business model, I would say. So probably like in the past, there was more of this, whether you do like software or you do hardware or whether your fund is like focusing on one vertical or, 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 or not, or is a generalist. So I think this differenti differentiation is not there anymore. But I would say that from our end, for example, what we focus on is like uh, B2B enterprise and where you mentioned like Horizon, for example, that even though it's also software that we invest in, uh, what we've seen is that across different funds, understanding of what's the investment length and, for example, for the startup to find customers and close customers, this is completely different. So the, the differentiation actually goes on that level. And of course, different verticals have different uh, different processes and lead times. So from that angle, like, you know, this specialization or not, this actually comes into play. And this is what Rokas presents. And on the other side, this is what me and Eva uh, in a way present. All right, thank you guys. And um, well, you might have guessed that um, I cannot let you off uh, without addressing what so far has been an elephant in the room in this panel, which is COVID-19, obviously. And um, at the moment, it's quite clear we are riding the second wave. Uh, who knows what will happen next? Uh, and many changes are out there. We can travel. We have to work remotely. Look at me. I'm here all alone at the stage. Would rather actually meet you face to face. But here we are, you know, zooming uh, from the comfort of our apartments, protecting our workstation from kids, being in pajamas and whatnot. But I would not like to start this rant about how things are negative and so on. But I would rather like uh, you to, um, you know, explore a little bit um, about during the last seven months, what has changed in your VC firms in response or in anticipation of something which COVID-19 has imposed on us? So what has changed? What are the perhaps adjustments you've done to your fundraising, if ever, to uh, the scouting again, or to due diligence, or to investment projects, or to meeting the teams? So what has changed? Uh, maybe early or, or yeah, yeah, yeah if, I, if I can yeah. start, I mean, what has changed, I would feel like there's more work <laughs> and that, that really comes from the fact that actually uh, you don't need time to move from one meeting to another. You can just switch from one meeting to another, meaning that you actually have many more hours to utilize like during the workday. It has positives and negatives, but mostly negatives uh, on, on our side that First of all, we really get to meet uh, different entrepreneurs from different locations. We don't have that restriction that we need to travel or we need to find like common time. People are much more available to meet. And one positive thing I've actually seen is also that from um, that, that the same is actually possible when we want to, for example, engage with our startups customers or startups partners that also like this uh, channel is, is there and, and this uh, availability. 
And in the past, it used to be, let's say, very senior level on enterprise side, they would never find time or very, it would be difficult to align the calendars. Now it's much easier. And definitely what we also see is that this digital transformation has been really pushed now on enterprises. And this is actually positively impacting, um, impacting like our portfolio as well, at least the ones that are working with enterprises. So there are some delays, of course, uh, due, to, due to COVID that, and that brings uncertainty, but overall um, our, our portfolio is very much like, um, let's say the products are, or, or the services are in a way very unique and they have already been in a strategic interest for the customers, so it's difficult to get rid of those platforms. So from that perspective, at least in our fund, there hasn't been that much impact actually of COVID. But of course, this so-called second wave is coming and this may expose like, you know, some of the startups to potential delays in, in securing new projects with customers, potentially. Thank you, yeah. Eva, how about you? I mean, I can you? just relate to what Ma Marilu said. So there is much more work to, much more time to work because you don't travel now, you don't go to the airport or to the railway station and kind of there is ex expectation that people are av available all the time because you know that everyone is actually, you know, at the laptop or on the mobile phone on LinkedIn. So people are more accessible, definitely. I think what, the, and also just to add to what Marily said, we see also that some of the industries that probably were not that attractive or didn't get that much attention from venture capital investors, like educational tech, mm -hmm. now the current boost, you know, make also investors rethink actually. And now I think there is much more attention going towards companies that probably were not, you know, those kind of hot spaces. A year ago, I think educational ed tech is definitely one of them. Of course, also in the health space, I think we see a leap forward that otherwise would have taken five years in terms of telemedicine adoption and so on. So there are definitely opportunities arising as well. Right. Thank you, Rokas. Would you like to add some insights? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think I I, I want to I want to probably contribute to the discussion through three points. One, which is kind of completely biased to where we focus. But uh, so, firstly, I think that from a deal sourcing perspective, quite a few things change. I think a lot of venture firms have understood uh, the power of brand. A lot of people started to talk about the fact that uh, <laughs> eventually. It's, it's about two things, why entrepreneur, which was one brand, like one VC over the other, is one people that are there to help them. So the value added part, which is usually, again, as itself, you mentioned COVID is a big elephant in the room, is, is value added is also another big elephant in the room. Uh, and, and then another part to it is also um, uh, the, the kind of the brand awareness and, and the platformization of venture capital as such. So a lot of big firms have done it before because they had like very significant investor resources to do that. Companies like Anderson Horowitz, Sequoia and the like. But I think a lot of smaller firms have went that route as well now. And we've seen that, especially in Europe context. So bigger firms like Atomico, EQT have now building power, like Speed Invest have built big platforms, uh, which are mimicking the kind of the, the kind of first move advantage in Silicon Valley which I believe is is where the venture capital will go. And then this value added will stem from the pal platform uh, value that it creates. So, and then going from that to my second point, a lot of VCs realize when there's no event, like the efficiency and and, and sort of the value, uh, the, the sort of value creation was something that was over missed because you were so busy with the deal flow. Uh, and a lot of people started to, think through ways how to aggregate that deal flow in a more systematic way. So more becoming, uh, or I would call it rob roboticized or in, in a way eaten by a software itself as a venture capital model. So spending less of a data by screening. So making saying no or yes quicker uh, and in a more processed way. And then focusing more of that time to that additional value added to help these teams because obviously COVID raised the importance of the venture capital is to be active and help these entrepreneurs when you know COVID happened because a lot of these teams have to go and hands-on work with them for the budgets and optimize the teams how to preserve the created jobs and and really push the revenue uh, through this period or how to attract additional fundraising which might not have been planned in 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 at the time before the COVID happened and my third and last part which is more related to us is that 
you know, I, I think a lot of people mentioned that on the internet, Bill Gates himself mentioned that, but you know, COVID is like a, is like a wave compared to climate change, meaning compared to a tsunami, you know, and, and a lot of people realized uh, that something that happened unexpectedly, which is COVID, uh, climate is quite repeatedly said that it will happen eventually. It's just the timing of it is again, very uncertain, but the, 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 the kind of tragic event that could happen eventually if we bypass some of the uh, you know, flags raised from science community and 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 various different organizations, uh, and not meet those expectations to push the capital that route or put the governments to be aware of these problems. This could become eventually way more tragic than uh, than than COVID. So I think this is three takeaways for me as most important was that what I take from COVID from the COVID kind of situation since early uh, um, April. Uh, and I think no one expected this, this V-shaped recovery, though. And I think venture capital expected this. Still, there's a lot of money. There's still the same problem as before COVID. There's lack of great ideas and great entrepreneurs. I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. It's way easier, one, than to be a venture capitalist to pick and back those great ideas. Uh, I think the, the, the absence of, of really uh, transformative ideas is even more acute. And... Um, and, and I think for us, it's a very exciting time because we believe that there is more people going into more complicated stuff to solve more complicated problems. And I think that is a lot of driven by motivation that was, I think, raised by the emergence of COVID and understanding that there is more important thing as, as another dog walking app. So uh, I, I take it as a good development. Thank you so much for, for, for your insights. I would like just for, for a little uh, short while and actually wrapping up this, this, this panel, too short, right? Uh, I would like to piggy bank on, um, on Eva's observation. So um, she mentioned that, for instance, you know, amidst COVID-19, EduTech is one of the, of the segments of software, for instance, which is, which is, being, uh, which is gaining so much attention. Um, a short, you know, speculative, um, opinions from from you guys what are other sectors for instance in software what exactly are those solutions and products which will get more opportunity in the future granted by covid 19 also rokos i would uh, also like you to 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 be the last to close the panel and and give us some examples of energy solutions which will gain this opportunity and not, uh, you know, be in misery, but thrive. So Eva, would you maybe like to continue? You were mentioning Edutech. Any other ideas what will be happening also yeah. in relation to your portfolio? Uh, yeah. I think that Edutech and eHealth, I think those are the very obvious one. And of course, the collaboration tools. Now every investor loves to look at collaboration tools, you know, video conferencing, enabling asymmetric work and so on. Maybe maybe some less obvious, but still, you know, obvious for investors. I'm super excited about looking now at solutions that enable companies to not just hire people remotely, but also really manage people remotely as there is a shift towards companies going to remote operations, which means they can hire people, not just, you know, in the hubs where they are based, but, you know, they have access to talent globally. So this is, I think this is an opportunity as well. But Marily, I, I leave it also to you. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer. That's why, in a way, as a VC, we, we build a portfolio of, of great uh, startups that we see out there. I think like uh, the opportunity and um, it, it can emerge everywhere in a way. If there's knowledge, if there's talent, if there's um, you know some understanding how you can really shift the industry where you have passion in as well. So from that angle, we try to find those, but if you ask me to pinpoint like one or two, uh, that would be, I, I wonder, <laughs> yeah. All right, Roka, so please be less cautious and, and place your bet. Which energy tech <laughs> product or solution is, is, is the one we should be paying particular attention to? I, I, I'll probably a bit rephrase. I think, as as Marilla said, to be very honest with everyone. I think if I would have, if I would know, I'd be a very rich man by now. If that's that's basically a saying that you you will just basically forecast the future. I think we're as investors we manage risk. That's why it's called you know venture capital. Some people address this risk capital, right? There's there's a lot of risk, great risk involved in that, and we're basically compensated for taking those risks while being minimizing the 
probability of placing a wrong bet. But I think what, what's important to always reflect in why venture capital, what makes someone successful and, and someone less successful is, is the ability to uh, at least somewhat get the timing right. So I think very fortunately, some of these critical shocking events raise the, the sensitivity of the matter of a problem to a different level. So I think very interesting spaces, obviously, micromobility and, and solutions like that, that, for example, happened in, in, in months for certain things to happen, well, it took years before. So something like online e-commerce, right? Like uh, happened, oh, like the development of, of increasing Amazon orders increased to a magnitude of 17% from 6%, and the 6% happened for, what, five years, and that happened over six months, right? So these are things that you cannot really guess, right? But you can be in that path, right? And for us, why I call micromobility is that, or, or e-mobility in general, is that this e-commerce race increased the ability how companies deliver these packages, right? So there is drone ecosystem, there is electric bike ecosystem that came off that. And, and, and that's where you can maybe be more right to take that bet in that small sub-segment. So uh, I would say there is very ample of great places to innovate in the energy sector. And the big two, three waves maybe that I would exclude of it is probably uh, are, are through a framework of basically saying that there is definitely a certainty that we're moving to renewables all across the spectrum of, of, of how we generate energy. And that causes a lot of problems, which are mostly now solved with uh, software. So optimization of, 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 of those generating assets. And then another part is, I think, uh, the whole mobility, but most importantly, the electrification mobility part, where it's both EVs and then in associated infrastructure, or there is light, light electric vehicles that are very interesting space. And then the last one is probably the sort of emphasis on the fact that we understand that if you are not addressing as part of ESG the E part, which is environmental, you will be heavily penalized, whether you're a private company or whether you're a public company. Thank so you, ability to tap into that is yeah. a very, very important. And I believe there's going to be an amplitude of very valuable companies that will go out of it. So a uh, very interesting space to look at as well. Thank you, Rokas. I'm really glad you're wrapping up on the environment, uh, environmental subject, which is actually quite dear to my heart. So uh, obviously not enough time. We could uh, go on for forever, I guess. So much to learn about the VC sector. Uh, the main probably takeaways I'm taking from this panel is that, well, control what you can control. Um, you know, anticipate what you cannot, run some scenarios. Timing is important to echo uh, what Rokas has just mentioned. And uh, yeah, still focus on your job and do it well, right? So I do wish you a very pleasant rest of the day and thank you so much for my great friends by now, I guess, uh, Eva, Marley and Rokas. So thank you guys. Thank you for connecting and being with us. Thank you for... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.